A year ago on the last Sunday of 2020, around that time, I preached a sermon entitled, A Fire Within Me. And I looked at it in these past few days, just last week. I actually pulled out three sermons from the past and that I kind of preached that summarized the year of 2020. And I was just looking at them as how they fit in summary of the, the end of the final week of the year of 2021. I would probably say the world, and certainly as a nation, we probably had a better 2021 than we had a 2020. 20, because it was in 2020 that the COVID pandemic hit the earth and they were, they were lining up freezer trucks in major cities because they didn't have enough room in hospital for the corpses of people who passed away. It's a very traumatic and difficult year. I would like to say that something good came out of that. I don't know that I can say that with very much uh, certainty in the big picture. We tend to be a people who have a hard time learning about our ways and what's important in life until it gets kind of to the very end but I think it certainly awoke us as a people of the earth that we don't have endless days. There is a time frame from beginning to end, as I like to say, like the milk jug. It's got a stamp on it that says it expires on this day. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, the Bible tells us that the Lord has numbered our days. And we like to think that we are in some way in control of that by going out and jogging and running. I know Deanna likes to go run outside and uh, trying to eat healthily, stay away from those donuts, those french fries. And uh, let's see what else is bad for you. Uh, don't jump in front of cars, I don't know. <laughs> Be wise. But in the end, we know that we really don't control our days. And when we get to the end of one year and the beginning of another year, you know, we sit down and we reflect on the past year, if we have any wisdom about us at all, and we try to figure out what was good and what wasn't good, what we'd like to see changed. And, of course, we make those silly New Year's resolutions about losing weight and not eating those french fries and whatever else might be out there. But in the end, we recognize that we are not in control of our days and the end of our days. And so it becomes important and it becomes easy to focus at the end of a year and as we look at the beginning of a new year to say, what are we going to do in 2022 that has the best, the most value? Yeah, there's probably some good in not eating those French fries. Though i am just confess right now, I'm going to eat French fries in 2022. I'm not going to go running with Deanna. It would be a short run. I told her I'd follow her in the truck. I'm not going to stay up at night worrying. I'm not going to think about a lot of things that maybe some people like to think about at the beginning of a new year and making a resolution. I'm not going to make any resolutions other than the one I have tried to make every year. And that resolution is to love God with all my heart, soul, strength, and body. 
give him my heart, surrender my life to him, and then just go for it. Let it go. Go with the flow of the Spirit of God. If God owns your heart, then follow your heart. You'll be happy. The real question comes into my mind. Making, having good thoughts and making good resolutions and wanting to do better, that's the easy part, right? I'm going to lose 50 pounds. That's the easy part to say that. And, of course, the reality hits at the end of the year that we figure out, oh, just like last year, it wasn't so easy to get it all done. Sometimes we stop at the end of the year and we say, man, I wish I would have. Some of you, Luke, has gotten into this recently. I wish I would have invested in that stock. Man, look what it did. Well, I wish I hadn't invested in that one. Look what it did. Luke got me involved in a little money, a little stock. He thought, oh, my dad, this was, it's, it's, a, it's a can't lose. Well, so far we're losing. <laughs> when you put it in there, you might as well just let it go. Forget it. You're going to lose it. And if you get surprised, hallelujah, but. So I want to talk to you about what to do this year, 22. I have two sermons in front of me, this and this. Maybe I'll do a mixture of it. What's in your heart for 22? What's in your heart? For this coming year. What's in your heart. For 2022. Have you even thought about it. Or are you just kind of going along. Day to day. Week to week. Are you the kind of person. Who doesn't like to plan. Doesn't like to think too far in the future. That's not such a bad idea. I, I can be that way. But in the big picture, in the broad picture, what would you like to say for a coming year? And don't give me the world peace and everybody's happy and all that stuff. That's, that's pretty lame. What about in your life? What would you like it to be said if you end your life at the end of 22, what would you like it to be said just for next year? Kind of what would, you, what would your summary be for 2021? In 2021, Rick ate the French fries. But what else could we say of significance for 2021? This is your last Sunday for 2021. Uh, what's the day? The 26th, 7th, 8th? I'm like Kayla. How many days we got left for this year? We got 31. Is it 31 days in the month? 30? So 28 minus 30, that's a high math problem there. So you got, count today, three days left in this year. Are you going to try to get in everything you promised back in 2020 for 21? Are you going to try to get it all done in the next three days? It's probably too late. So what are you going to do for next year, and how would you summarize this past year? Let's look in the book of John. That's where I've been. I want to lay a call of the Lord on you that I think the Lord has given us. This sermon, and I'll probably wait till next year. It'll be the first sermon of the next year that I preach. It's called, uh, I called it A Fire Within Me. Deanna asked me, what's the title? I said, well, this one's A Fire Within Me. This one, I didn't really have a title. So 
a call to fire, I think, is what I ended up giving her to put on YouTube. But there's a fire in me that was in me at this time last year. In fact, I think the day last, uh, I don't know, two Fridays ago, three Fridays ago, when Chad and Cody and the family got into Austin, Chad came by my office on a Friday. It was a Friday, right, Chad? And we saw each other for the first time in two years. I mean, we've talked on the phone, but to sit down in, the, in my office face-to-face, -face, uh, we gave each other a hug and said, man, it felt good to be with each other, to see each other. I love Chad a lot. He is uh, a great blessing to me, an inspiration to me, and a son to me. And Chad asked something like, so what's new? What's been going on? I should bring Chad up here and see what he remembers what I said. Cody says yes. Come on up here, Chad. Grab that mic. I told Chad I was going to be a co-preaching sermon. He didn't believe me. So, you, tell me what you remember about when you came into my office several Fridays ago and we saw each other for the first time. And you said, what's up? Or what's been going on? Or whatever you asked, I don't remember. Do you remember? Your mind better than mine? Uh, yes, I remember you catching me up on specific things in the church. And then you began sharing about your heart to go pray and to fight. And I said, Rick, you haven't changed a bit. I don't know if that's where you're going with this, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's what I remember of the conversation so far. And what did I tell you was in my heart, or what did you remember me telling you I felt I was about? Uh, specifically, I remember going, you preparing to go pray over Nariah and to be with family. And also... Uh, the preparation, you were spending so much time in prayer and a rising up and, an, and a strengthening and you're facing not only at what's going on in the family, but also different things in different ministries, changes in the church, uh, changes in the food ministry, and you were catching me up on all that. And that's, for me, it was the thing that I remember is that it was a time of preparation and great rising up to meet those challenges. Okay, let me clue you to the word I'm looking for. Yeah, what are you looking for? <laughs> Great awakening. That's right. Okay. And I know that you had said that I want God to use the difficulty that you're facing here, that God would do such a miracle and that, that he would use this as the a springboard, a catalyst. I don't think those are your words, but this is what the kind of I remember to start a revival, to start an awakening, not only uh, of where Rachel, uh, Rachel and Randall live, but may it be awakening there, that it be awakening here, that God would use these events to change our lives and our hearts. I said to Chad, before I hit my expiration date, I have been just crying out to the Lord for the mercy, for the glory of an awakening, a spiritual awakening on this land. I said, I'd be happy to start in our church, in our community, in the city, an awakening to the presence, the person, the love, the salvation of the Son of God. I pray that before I pass, that I might participate in an awakening, a spiritual awakening, unlike has been seen in the history of man across the entire globe. There's been awakenings here and there, and we've had somewhat of an, a, a spiritual awakening in our midst. But I've said, Lord God, I'm looking for more. I'm looking for deeper. I'm looking for transformation. 
the reason they keep you up here, Chad, is I also remember visiting with you about what's up in Latvia. And you have been sharing with me both over the phone in the last couple of years the battle for this same thing in the churches. Why don't you share some of that experience of the churches that you've been working with in Latvia in regards to awakening? Uh, yeah, matter of fact, on uh, one of the Thursday nights, we were, when we meet with the men, Charlie asked me a question. He said, what's the greatest thing that you've learned after being gone and, and coming back? And he, he was also, Charlie was asking, what's it like there? And I said, I learned this about the church is, is um, it's not unique to us in the West that we go through patterns and deadness and dead religion and, and thinking that we, you know, I've got it figured out. I'm, I'm doing what God's called us to do. I'm going to church. I'm serving. And, and you can go to Latvia. And churches, in, in my perspective, are filled with people coming. They know that they're supposed to come. They, they feel obligated to come. But there is a, um, there's a deadness. There's a dryness. There, the idea that people are checking boxes and, and following man-made religion is not unique to us here in America, but it is, is truly worldwide. And uh, I would even say it's even more oppressive there and harder there because such pain and difficulty from occupations and the things that the country has been through. Uh, but people are tired. People have given up. People are just trying to make it day by day. And I don't even know that they even believe that a movement of God is available in their life, many of them, and have even given up. They, they come to church, they check the box, and they go home. So how do you approach that in you wanting to be a difference? Well, I had that same conversation with a... Uh, pastor of a church and he uh, he said Chad uh, the, the church is dead and, and he said I'm struggling and um, he said I don't know what to do and I said well let me come meet with you and I, not that I knew <laughs> it's not like I was talking to some pastors that are older than me and have been doing this much longer than me but I said Let's meet together and let's just begin praying. And I, and I went to them and I said, let's do this. Let's be the church that we want to see in the congregation. Let's be the church that we, the, the liveliness, the fire, the passion, the love of God. What we want to see in the rest of the body, let's let it just start with us. And let's make a commitment to one another. And if the Bible says that these things are possible, then we're going to believe that these things are possible. And we're going to pursue these things. And if the Bible says that we're supposed to be confessing, confessing our sins to one another, guess what? We're going to confess our sins to one another. And if it says we're going to be laying hands on one another and praying over one another, then we're going to lay our hands and pray over one another. And if it says that we're going to repent, we're going to repent together as a group. We're going to repent individually. We're going to do all of these things. And... Um, I thought I was going to run them off. <laughs> I thought they'd say, no, thank you. But they looked at me and said, we want that. We want that. Let it start with us. And we began meeting. And week after week, we began praying and seeking God and crying out. And we meet together. We worship. And we confess. And we talk. And we share. And we pursue God together. And then all of a sudden, other people are being drawn into our small group. And the worship leaders are coming in saying, can we be a part of this? We want to be a part of what y'all are doing in here. And it's attractive because it's authentic. And people are looking for an authentic relationship with God. I will tell you, I don't want to take over your sermon. But the church, cool. people are tired. Here's my, my experience. Ser here's my sermon. <laughs> Mine's even shorter. Uh, I will tell you that people are tired of dead religion. People are tired of, they've seen it. They have seen people confess Christ and not live it. They have seen people say that I'm a Christian and not do anything and look exactly like the rest of the world. But when you walk in with a passion and a fire and a love of God, people come to you and they say, why, what do you have that I don't have? 
And I would say it's even more, the, the juxtaposition, the, 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 you stand out even more when you walk in and, and Latvia and, and people are sad and people are hurting and people are lonely and people are depressed. One of them, the greatest, you know, highest rates of depression uh, right there in the Baltics and suicide and it's not a good place. It's a depressive place. But you know what? If you come in with a fire and a love of God, people are drawn to it and you stand out. It doesn't turn off. You, you have to open it, pop the battery out. No, I'll turn it off. Last year, it was my desire to move forward in this life. You know, you've heard me. I've been my whole life in church. Most of it dead. Most of it, I went because I had to go. I don't have to go anymore. I could have, hey, guys, y'all preach. I'll be back in a month. I'm going somewhere and uh, take off. I don't have to preach. I don't have to be in church anymore. But I must walk. I must see that which is still in front of me in the life of the Son of God. That which is still available that I've not tasted, I've not been filled, I've not experienced with the things of God. Then that leads me to this first sermon I had. There still remains a fire within me. To walk with the Lord God. There still remains a fire to see the Lord. As men before me have gone and have seen the Lord, have walked with the Lord, been filled with the Spirit, done the works of God. I, I read the prophets and I'm inspired. It fans the flames. I read the apostles' writings and it inspires me. I read the words of Jesus Christ and it just inflames me to say, Lord God, why not me? Why not here? Why not now? Why not us? Do you have that same passion? Do you raise, do you raise those questions to the Lord? Yourself, in chapter, don't, don't turn there, but in chapter 6, I'm reminded of Jesus talking about him being the bread of life. He had just fed the 5,000, and he, people are all concerned about the physical food, and then he picks up that physical food concept, and he moves it to the spiritual realm, and he says, I am the bread of life. And I said, Lord, feed me. Feed me that I might be strong, that I might be anointed. Feed me. And then you jump to chapter 7, and he says what I read to you earlier, I am the living water. I, he says, I, uh, whoever is filled with me, whoever drinks of me will not have this hunger and this thirst. And I think, Lord God, what it would it be like? I've never known the day that I didn't have the hunger and the thirst because I was so overwhelmed. I was so fed. I remember reading a book of D.O. Moody, his story, and he writes that he went about working the preaching and he was building the YMCA's with, uh, back then it was working with, it was a Sunday school ministry for children in the streets of Chicago, and he was busy and he had many organizations and he was just drying up and he was getting tired. And then one day some uh, lady said, hey, we have an apartment, nobody's using it. Why don't you go to the apartment and cry out to God? And he went to that apartment and he began to cry out to God. And he said as he prayed that night, the Holy Spirit began to fall on him as wave after wave after wave, like the waves of the ocean began to wash across him, began to fill him, began to cleanse him, began to renew him, began to bring in him a strength in the fire. And he said for certain Several hours the Spirit of God just kept rolling upon him and then it became so heavy, so strong. He said that it was, came to a moment that I felt like I was not ever going to be able to breathe again because the weight of the Spirit of God was so hard and heavy on me. Physically, I was having a, I was having a hard time getting a breath of air. I thought, wow. Yes, Lord, that. 
Finally, he cried, enough, O Lord, enough, I'm full. I have more than I can carry now. He said, I preached the same sermons, but everything changed. I did the same work, but God was present. And I said, yes, Lord. Give me, as a Samaritan woman said, give me that living water. I continue to thirst and to hunger. But I want to give you something. In chapter, back to chapter 15 of John, where I said we were going to start. I want to give you a focus. How? How can we do this? How can we have this living water? How can we have this bread of life? How can we have this anointing, this empowerment of the Spirit of God, of the life of Jesus Christ? How can we walk this miraculous, un, impossible, undoable life on this earth in this year, 2022? How can we be different than we've ever been in any days of our lives in the presence and the work of of the Son of God? Is it your passion? Is it your desire to be who you've never be, been? Is it your desire to do what you've never done? Do you have a thirst and a hunger to go with God where you've never gone? For His hands to burn through you? For His voice to speak through you? Do you have this thankfulness for what He has done Yesterday's manna was good yesterday. But today it's old and rotted and wormy. Today I need a fresh anointing. I need a fresh manna. I need a fresh feeding of the Spirit of God. Because I want to be different. Lord, what does that look like? How do I become this person of, that, is, that I have this craving within me for? I shared this with Chad and he laughed and he said... Well, nothing's changed. You were saying the same thing when I left several years ago. I said, yes, I haven't found anything better. I didn't taste anything better. I didn't see anything on the earth that was more appealing. I can't think of something more desirable. I've had some good days with the Lord this last year. Last two years, the Lord has been miraculous. When the COVID came through, 30 to, I don't know, somewhere between 30, 50 people, I lost count, came through here sick, and the Lord healed them instantly right here in this building or in the parking lot. People were carried in, and they, were, and they walked out celebrating. And I go, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's a joyous thing of God I want to do. But then we hit 21 and everybody got well. Oh. Everybody said, thank God. I said, well, everybody got well in 20 after they got sick. The Lord sent us money. I handed out money when people couldn't work. We handed out 20000 a little more than $20,000 in the church that just came in out through the mail. Said God spoke to me, told me to send this to her. You don't know me, I don't know you, but here's 20 grand. And I handed it out for people for rent and cars and whatever. That was pretty glorious, but we had to run out of money. The healings were pretty glorious, but we had to be sick. If you want to see a great miracle, you need to have to have a great need. If you want to see a really spectacular miracle, you have to have a really spectacular impossibility. We have one in Ohio, we're wrestling out. Come 22, I don't know what's coming down. I don't know if there's another variant that, you know, people get all crazy about. I don't know if we're having an economic. Some people tell me, oh, no, we're about to have an economic crash. Come March, Rick, pull your money out. Well, my money's not going to matter if I lose it so little. It's going to crash. All the economy's going to crash. Be, be back to whatever. We got a variant coming. We're going to be sick. We're going to lose our money. Well, wow, we might as well just go into our lives right now. So it sounds so miserable. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's a promise. There's a way. There's a way of the Lord that's not the way of man. 
that we have available to us in 2022. There's a work calling upon each one of us that if we focus, engage ourselves in this work, we will prosper in the kingdom of God. We will again trust him to heal our sicknesses, to provide our, our needs, to bring us joy in the midst of dark days, to bring us peace in nights where there's no peace on the earth, to bring us the love that we share with one another when everybody's scrambling and fighting. I mean, if it's not the violence on the street and the economy about to crash or the next great pandemic going to come through, man, why do we even, what do we have a hope to go forth in? Why do we even get up in the morning? But we're not, that, we're not like those of the world who are without hope. We are the children of God. We have the presence of the Spirit of God. We have the call of God. We have the promises of the Lord. What do we do? Verse 1, chapter 15, John. I am the vine. I am the true vine. And my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may produce or bear more fruit. So, how would you summarize your year, 2021? Was it a fruitful year in the kingdom, in the spirit of God? Or was it a barren year? Did you see the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody? Did you see someone that you got to share with come to faith? Did you go into the sick? I love Natalie's stories. One goes into the, the school and begins to pray for the sick. And she says, lo and behold, a teacher got, got healed on, in the spot in the classroom as we were praying for her. Have you been able to go and pray for the sick? Have you been given sufficiency and had the heart to go and share? If you have two tunics, give one. Have you had the heart of Christ, compassion for those who are struggling and fighting and desperate? I talk to people all the time and they're just walking, as Chad talked about. We're just walking through the motions just kind of hanging on saying, is there something else? Is there a reason to live another day? Is there something to hope for? Or am I just trying to build walls around that the pandemics and the market crashes and the violence of the street doesn't personally touch me and my family? Are we living in fear and desperation or are we living with power and joy and going out and being the light, the salt of the earth? Jesus said, Every branch that does not bear fruit, that means they're not in him, is cut off. Do you feel that you were cut off last year? Cut off of the presence, the anointing, the work of God. And those who bear fruit, what's he say? He lets them just go and lets them grow any wild crazy. No. He disciples, he disciplines, he directs in a way they become more fruitful. Because, brothers and sisters, in 2022, listen to me. In 2022, the greatest year you can have is to be, be a person who bears the fruit of God. For such you were created. To bear the fruit of God that his life would flow through you. The river of living water would, would uh, complete you, fulfill you. The bread that uh, you'll never hunger again would be yours. It is expressed in this way already. He talks about, uh, he prunes it. Already you are clean because the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me. Abide in me, he says, to become one with me. To abide with one another is best seen on the earth in the marriage, in a, in a very good marriage relationship. We abide with one another. We become one. We're intimately one. 
We are sharing each other's life. We are strengthening and lifting up and holding one another up. We're about the same work, the same purpose. We are united. He said, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. So I would say, brothers, when we talk about what is it to have a revival, what is it to have a spiritual awakening, it is to develop a relationship, strengthen the place where we are connected with Jesus Christ and the spirit of the Holy Spirit flows through Christ, the vine, into us, the branch, that we might produce fruit in the year of 2022. You're not going to have a better year unless you have a better abiding with the Son of God. You're not going to bear more fruit unless you have an increase in the life of the Spirit of God flowing from the Son of God in and through you, in through and out your hands, your mouth, your life, and you bear the fruits of God. Abide in the Lord. You say, Rick, how do I get started? You get started by your recognizing and emphasizing that place of abiding, that place where you are united with Christ. You focus on your relationship with Jesus Christ above every other purpose of your life. You increase the connection, the size of how your relationship works with him. He said, I am the vine. In verse 5, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. See, there's nothing we can do to bear fruit. It must flow from Jesus Christ. It must flow from the Son of God. And it flows by the power and the work and the life of God the Holy Spirit. And then you will bear fruit. It reminds me of the scripture of Romans, I'm sorry, of Ephesians 2.10. He said before you were born. What? Before creation, before you were born, what did he say? I knew you and? Ephesians 2.10. Maybe somebody ought to look it up. What's it say there? Somebody got it? Ali, you have it? Ephesians 2.10. What's it say? You were created to bear fruit. You were created to be his worker, to bear fruit, to be, his, uh, to be his work on the earth. And God created that work, that opportunity before you were even born. It was prepared for you. You don't have to create it. It was prepared for you before you were born. You must abide with the, brand, uh, with the vine. You must abide with Jesus. And if you abide, if you're intimate with, if you pursue the Lord Jesus Christ every day, you know what happens if I go and I take a branch and I graft it into the vine and then a couple of days later I go cut it back off and then about a week later I come and graft it again and then a couple of weeks later I cut it off What's going to happen? We're going to bear no fruit. The branch will die. We must every day get up in the morning and pursue our relationship with the Son of God. Every day plead with Him for the anointing, the living water, the living bread flow through us by His Spirit breathed upon us. His Spirit flowed through us every day in 2022. 365 days, we must focus on, we must uh, engage ourselves in this relationship of abiding. 
Not with your work. Not with your spouse. Yeah, those things are good. But they're not the most important. Those will prosper and fall by your abiding with the Son of God. He said, Whoever abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. You can't stop it. How can you, you know, I preached this last Wednesday. How can you preach five times, seven times a week? Sometimes on post-it notes. How can you do it week after week for 26 years here? How can you do it for 52 years since age 15? I started preaching. How can you do it since I was seven years old, 60 years of having started to walk and to learn and, and trying to abide with God? How can you do it week after week, year after year? Unless there is new life flowing through you from the Son of God, the Spirit of God flowing in you, filling you, anointing you, strengthening you, empowering you, giving you fresh fruit every day. I must go and I must call on the name of the Son of God. Every night I must cry out to Him and I must ask Him to teach me to forgive me of my sins. I must ask Him to anoint me, to prepare me for the days to come. Most everything I preach is done like this. I wait on the Lord through the night. And when I win the war of the relationship with the Lord versus the relationship with the flesh, when I win that war in the nighttime, the next day is won. The fruit is ready. The fruit is flowing through the branch, you, and ready to come out your hands in what you do, what you teach, what you show, how you live. The Spirit of God will produce fruit. The Spirit of God came in Acts 2, fell upon the church, and immediately began to produce fruit when fishermen stood up and preached, and thousands were saved. When unlearned men began to teach the learned, when the anointing of the Spirit of God began to fall on those who were sitting at the gate beautiful in chapter 3 of Acts, who had been invalid for all their life, 40-something years, and Peter comes by and says, I don't have any money, but you know what? I spent some time with Jesus Christ, and he gave me something, and I'm going to give it to you. Fruit flowed through Peter into the lame man. Fruit must flow through us by the Spirit of God if we're going to be joyful in 22, if we're going to be productive in 22, if we're going to have a successful and a great year in 22, we must be about the flowing of the Spirit of God, producing fruit, increasing the kingdom of our Father. When someone asks you, what do you do for a living? Just tell them, I work for my dad. We have, a, we have a family business. What's that? Oh, we produce fruit. Oh, what kind of fruit? Love, joy, peace. Oh, there's more. The life of Christ flows through me by his spirit. I've been drawing Social Security for a couple of years now. Man, that's something to retire on, I tell you. Whew. Not. But it doesn't matter if it was paying me $10,000 a month. What's in my heart? What must flow through me is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Or I die. Like the prophet said, like Paul said, if I don't preach, cursed am I. If I don't preach, I die. If I don't fulfill the call of God, if you don't fulfill the call of God, then you will dry up. You will die. You will be cut off. Those who refuse to be connected to the, to the branch, those 
I mean, to the vine, those who refuse to surrender into that relationship, they're cut off and they're thrown. Where? The fire. There's no reason to live. There's nothing good left outside of the life that flows from Christ through us. Brothers, 22 has to be your focus, your daily manna, your daily flowing river into your heart that you might increase, strengthen, broaden the, the connection between you and the vine, the Son of God, that the Spirit of God may flow through you and the Spirit of God may do things that you have never experienced before in your life. I get greedy. I said, God, I want to do what I've not done. I read the promises. I want that promise. I see the gifts, the talents. Yeah, I want those too. I see the works of God. See, yeah, I want to do those. Because I don't know anything else. It's like the man of this earth. He is driven by his flesh for the things that are of comfort, for the things that are glittery and silvery, you know, the tech, the, the stuff. It's natural through our human life and flesh to desire those things. But it's more natural for the fruit of Christ to flow and for us to desire it of we who are ch children of God. Where did I leave off? I don't know. Let's look at. Let's jump over to verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you wish. Oh, no, no, no. If you abide in me, if you get this relationship right where you're producing fruit and your purpose of life is producing fruit and your focus of life is maintaining and increasing that relationship, that connection between you and the vine. If you abide in me, you become one in me and my words, my commandments to you abide in you. If that's your purpose of life, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Wow. That's got to be. Anybody got some white out? We need to white that out. I don't think we really believe that. I don't even think we want to try to believe that. It's just too far out there. It will be done for you. Why? By this my father is what? Is what? Glorified. Is what? Glorified. All right. Yesterday. Where was Christ, where was the Father glorified in your day? 2021, what, what are some things that jump out at you where the Father was glorified? Jesus said, if you'll be about the business of glorifying my Father, ask me anything, because that's what I want to do. That's what I'm doing. I will flow through you with the anointing of my spirit and the empowerment of my spirit. Was 21 a year that glorified the Father in your marriage? I don't know, but you don't know that wife I got, Rick. Yeah, but I know you. Yeah, but you don't know that boss. Impossible. I know the boss of all bosses. Yeah, but you don't know my financial situation. I know the king is rich. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Church, what's it take? To say, you know what? I don't know how old you are, but just in your mind, you know, how, you know how many years you've lived? How many of them have been about, this is the year of glorifying the Father. This is the year of focusing on my relationship with the vine. This is the year that the Spirit of God flows through me 
and produces fruit. Let me tell you something that was just glorious for me last Sunday in the Spanish church. I invited people. I just felt the anointing of the Spirit of God, and I felt the, the presence of the Lord. And I said, and we were almost through with our worship. We were in that last phase of prayer and music. And I said, if, if some of you have a prayer need, come on, let me pray with you. All the adults stood there. Sometimes it feels like we get the white knuckles. Hang on, hang on. It's only going to be a few minutes. And the little boy came, I don't know, six, seven years old, Joseph. How old's Joseph? Hilma's son. Eight? Okay, eight. He came up to me, stood right here, and said, I got a raw throat. It really been hurting all week. Would you pray for my throat? No, go back, sit down. I'm looking for an adult. Reject the children, only receive the adults, right? Huh? No? Is that wrong, Derek? <laughs> That's wrong, he says. I said, sure, Joseph, come on. Put my hand on his throat, begin to pray. Well, I got to pray, and I said, how'd you feel? He said, still there. I said, oh, let me pray again. Put my hand on his throat, begin to pray again. I'm about 30 seconds into praying again, and he looks up to me and goes, Pastor, Pastor. Yes? You can stop praying now, it's gone. All right, I'll go sit down. <laughs> and then he got up Friday, two nights ago, and told that story. An eight-year-old. And then another little girl came up, and then another little boy. We had eight children of eight years old or less. Eight lined up right here. Eight children. Prayed over them, prayed over them. Friday night, they stood up and said, God answered my prayer. God healed me. Another one had another request. God answered their request. Eight children. You know what, brothers and sisters? If 2021, uh, 22 for you is not the year of the Son of God, the glory of God, then God will raise up another generation and you will be cut off and you will dry up and you will be empty of fruit. Who wants that? Don't raise your hand, please. Don't raise your hand. God will raise up another generation. He's always done it that way. The Moses generation was buried in the desert. The Joshua generation crossed the river. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And so... Prove to be my disciples. You know what? The disciples of the Lord bear fruit. Who said amen? Say it again. The disciples, the children of God, who are engrafted into Jesus Christ, bear fruit. Why? Because he tells us in first book of uh, John in third chapter, the seed of God abides within us. Does the Holy Spirit abide in you? It tells us in the chapter 8 of Romans that those who abide in the Spirit have life and they're children of God. Those who abide in the flesh are children of sin and their life leads to death. Who are we going to be in 22, brothers, sisters? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Amen? Amen. I could stop right there, but I'm not going to. I got one more verse. Actually, I got more verses than I'm going to finish. I'm only going to finish about half this sermon. Look at verse 15. Those who abide with Christ, this is what he says. Those of you, he will say next year, 22, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friend for all that I have, 
For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and what? Bear fruit. Bear fruit that you shall, that you, and that your fruit shall abide that whatever you, what? Ask. Whatever you what? Ask. Ask. Well, sometimes we don't even bother asking. But if you bear fruit, you'll have no trouble asking. The Father in my name, I will give it to you. Hallelujah. These things I command you. So you will love one another. I'm not going to preach that. Let's just move to chapter 16. Because I got five minutes. Look at verse 4. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. He talks about being hated by the world when we bear fruit. I do not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. And now I'm going to him who sent me. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, where would have been the place to be? Wherever he was, he was God walking on this earth in the flesh incarnate. He was creator, the eternal, the giver of life, the, re the revealer of the Father, the one who blessed, the one who gave life, who fed, who healed, the one who revealed all the truths when he walked the earth for those years the only place it would have been proper for us to be would have been to be with him but he says I'm going to go away because you guys are all just gathered around me it's like that little you ever I, I, when I was uh, years ago when Philip was six years old or so I got conned into coaching a soccer team. And my soccer team was everybody who was not drafted. Anybody who was any good got drafted. We were new into the community and in Georgetown. And Phyllis said, I'd like to play soccer. So we went to the soccer meeting. And we waited for everybody to get drafted. And then you know who was left? The people who were not known, the little 40-pound girl, the kid, little kid with the big glasses. There was about a dozen kids that either didn't, nobody knew them or you could tell, man, they're not going to be any good. And they were left over. And I said, hey, how about these kids? And they said, you coach them. Okay. I didn't know anything about soccer. I didn't know you, the field was split or nothing. So I went and got a couple of books, and I read them on soccer, and I took these kids out to practice. And, you know, you're supposed to spread them out in different positions. You know what happens when six-year-olds play soccer? Wherever the ball goes, there they go, <laughs> chasing the ball. I could not ever break them from that. I'd put them all across the field. No, you stay right here in this, in this area. I mean, the minute the ball was kicked, <laughs> They just followed the ball. And it was okay because the kids on the other team did the same thing for the most part. We didn't win a game that year. But we ate a lot of ice cream after practice. <laughs> you know, when Jesus was on the earth, the only place to be was with him. But like soccer, we all have a place where we're supposed to be. We occupy the field. She said, I got to go. I can't spend the rest of y'all's life all huddled around me. So he said, I'm going to go. And when I'm going to go, let's see, is that what he says here? Is that what I have here? I'm just making this as I go here. 15, let's go to, I'm sorry, 16, verse 22.
Come on, let's jump back up to 12, 16, 12. I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them right now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will, deliver, he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me for what he takes is what is mine and declare it to you. He had to leave so the spirit of God could come. And when the spirit of God came and filled every disciple and then Jesus ascended into heaven, who was left? Were they all going to gather around Peter and say, okay, Peter, you're next. Wherever you go, we're going to follow you. Was that what they did? No. Did they say, okay, we have a, we have a club here. We have a, a unique club here. And we're just going to hang together and be together. No. When the Spirit of God came, he became the fullness of, of God, as it says in the third chapter of Ephesians. The fullness of God filled each one. Brothers, you have the fullness of God. Jesus left so you would have the fullness of the Spirit of God, the seed of God upon you, so you don't have to huddle and live your life around a preacher or a church or a denomination, or an event, or an organization, but that you are one with God, you are with the vine, and through the vine you individually receive the sufficiency of the Spirit of God that will flow through you and take you wherever you are to go to occupy your place on this earth and produce the fruit of God. Amen? Amen? It's not enough to gather on Sunday mornings. I praise God. He called us to do it, and we gather to spur one another, to teach one another, to encourage one another, to pray over one another. But from this meeting, from this joint life that we share in the Lord, we must go out and bear fruit. You don't need to bear fruit in this room right now. Other than the fruit of love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body, and to worship him. But you must go to where God has called you into the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. And you go because God himself lives within you. And the same God who empowered the Son, Jesus, to do all the works of the Father, to speak all the works of the words of the Father, will empower you to speak all the words of the of the Son and all the works of the Son. We must go. We must be about the Father's business. You are you have been given the Spirit of God to do such things. Verse 22, we'll close. So also you have sorrow now because Jesus was going. But I will see you again. Did you hear that? The Lord said, I'm going to see you again. We all, I, I could have started in chapter 14, verse 1. Don't be sad. Because where I'm going, I'm preparing a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I'm coming back for you. I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice. And no one can take away your joy. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, I say to you, whatever. Truly, truly. It's like he emphasizes a double emphasis. I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. He said, if you ask anything of me to glorify my Father, I'll give it to you. Now he says, if you anything of the Father to glorify me, he'll give it to you. Produce fruit and ask for whatever it takes to do that. 
And Jesus said, I'll give it to you. But you must be producing fruit. You must be asking. Until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And later he talks about overcoming the world so all this will happen. Brothers and sisters, this message means something to you if the Spirit of God flows through you. And if the Spirit of God does not flow through you, this message means nothing to you. You can go about 2022 as you went about 21 and 20 and so forth. Or you can say there's got to be a better day coming in the kingdom of God in my life. There's got to be fruit I've never borne before. The oranges become the size of grapefruits. The work of God is increased in you. I don't know that there was a better day this last year than see eight little kids come up and experience the life and presence of God upon them. A miraculous encounter with God. I don't know if there was a better day in my whole last year than that moment. And then to get up Friday, and I had to get the mic because, you know, they talk so little, little, little. But I had to get a mic so everybody could hear. And some I had to prompt a little bit because they're so timid. But they all said, I came up, asked God to heal me, or asked God for so something in particular, other things. And God did it. When's the last time you could say that? Are we going to say that through the month? Oh, no, we got three days left. Into next year? Just bow our heads. Are you challenged? It keeps me awake at night. I anguish for the lost. I anguish for the life of Christ. I anguish for the Spirit's anointing. And I say, Lord God, have mercy on me. Cleanse me and fill me again. I know I have not seen the depth, the width, the height of the love of God and the kingdom upon myself. And I will strive. I will abide. I will draw into the Son of God day and night, or in my case, it's night and then day. For I will not be satisfied with yesterday's manna. I will be about the business of a great awakening for the glory of Christ. The great awakening is nothing more than God revealed that men might come to him and experience life abundant. I will not be content until we are baptizing, until we are hearing the testimonies. I'm not content when I say, anybody have a testimony? And there's silence in the room like death. Until the glory of God is poured out on his people. 
and his people speak up and glorify. I will not be content until the Son of God is raised up in our lives like he's never been raised up before. The only way you're going to finish well is to win every single day individually. What do you say? Oh, Spirit of God, river of living water, flow through me, refresh me. Oh, bread of heaven, fill me that I want no more till I am full and overflowing and the fruits of God are flowing through me. And if this is my last year, hallelujah, I'm going to leave fruitful into the reward of heaven. No regrets. No embarrassment upon entering. I told Chad, I want to see that in our church. He said, you were saying the same thing when I left. I said, hallelujah, when you come back in five years, I want to be saying the same thing if I'm still here. Because I have nothing better to live for and to purpose my life for. How about you, brothers? How about you? Are you producing fruit? Is your relationship with Jesus the vine sufficiently strong enough for the spirit to flow through and produce fruit in you? Can you lift up your hand right now and say, Lord God, remember when? Remember when? I told you the story when I was in Ohio praying for my granddaughter. I was saying, no, Lord God, remember when you did this glorious work and you did that glorious work and you did this other glorious work, all impossibilities. Remember, God, as you've done in the past, and like Habakkuk, I said, do it again. Do it again in 22 but do it better, greater. Consume more of me. Consume my days, my nights, my thoughts, my my heart's anguish and desires. Consume where my feet walk. Consume what my hands do. Consume what my mouth speaks. Oh, Spirit of God, consume my heart and my mind. Until your glory is revealed on this earth around me. And then I will be satisfied. I pray for a fire within us. That was the title of my sermon. I didn't preach a fire within us. Maybe I'll do it next Sunday and the following Sunday. I don't know. A fire, a fire, a fire of God. Burn, oh God, burn in me. Like the fire fell on Mount Carmel 
when Elijah was before 400 prophets, that either they died or he died. Come, O oh Lord God, consume our offering this day. Come, fires. You came and you picked up Enoch and you took him into heaven. Come, fire of God. As you came upon Elijah and lifted him up and took him into the heavens, come, O oh fire of God. As you fell upon the temple of Sol Solomon prayed and you consumed everything, O oh Lord God, come. As you have come so many times before Moses in fire, O oh Lord. As you came at Pentecost and covered the 120 by the, and they saw fire. You came as fire and consumed each one. Come, O oh fire of God, upon me. Or I will be undone. I will not be able to go forth another day. Not another day, Lord. Come, I pray. Son of God, breathe on your church, your fire, your spirit. Amen. I would have liked to have music. But somebody preached too long. I think it was Chad. <laughs> God bless. Everybody hug.